neuropsychologists do diagnostics, uh, consultation uh, to physicians and other members of the healthcare team, providing information um, relating to mental status changes, um, cognitive difficulties, emotional uh, changes, coping, a wide variety of things that might be put under the banner of mental status. Um, and looking at the relationship between brain and medical factors on one hand, on the one hand, and behavior and cognition and emotion on the other hand. Because the, the brain is organized um, in, a, in a very sophisticated manner, when you have a stroke, depending on where the stroke is, you're going to see predictable consequences. And the brain, we're used to thinking about the brain's involvement in sensory and motor functions, our ability to walk and talk, see and hear and feel, but the brain does a whole bunch of other things. And um, those systems are organized just like the motor and the sensory systems are organized. And so cognition, the way we think, concentration, uh, language, um, our ability to speak, our ability to problem solve, our insight, our judgment, the way we feel, whether we're happy, um, whether we have depression or whether we're anxious, irritable, all of that is organized in the brain. And so when you have a stroke and it affects a particular part of the brain, it'll impact on those systems. And so you'll see predictable consequences. Now something like concentration is a, is a function that's organized in a very diffuse way in the brain. And so sometimes what you see is very basic types of concentration being affected. The person can't stay online. So that if you're speaking with them, they may not be able to follow the conversation. They lose their set. Or they may get distracted. If there's someone speaking in the hallway, they can't focus on you and not listen to that. But if there's a fire alarm, your brain wants to be able to tell you, hey, pay attention to this sim signal because that's important. You need to not listen to the conversation and listen to the noise out there because it's important. And that ability to shift, that ability to make those judgments, that ability to filter things out or not, depending on what's best judgment, all of that is part of the concentration and attentional system. There's also um, uh, a, a role that the brain plays in terms of speed of processing. And so in order to keep pace with things and to be able to handle multiple bits of information at once, that's part of the concentration and attention system too. So when someone has a stroke in certain parts of the brain, those systems can be impaired. And so under normal circumstances, in a quiet room, the person can concentrate, pay attention, read their book, watch television, everything's fine. But if the phone's ringing, the kids are yelling, somebody's calling at you from the other side of the room, you've got three things you're trying to do, you're working on the stove, you've got email you have to go and look at. If all of those things are happening at once, then your ability to keep pace, stay on track, be vigilant, filter out, pay attention if it's important, that becomes way, way too difficult and the brain can't keep up. Concentration is one of probably the, the, mo the more difficult things because it's, it's almost a moving target. It depends on what you're trying to concentrate on, what the nature of the thing is that you're trying to concentrate on, and what's going on in your environment. And sometimes knowing that that's an issue, and not just the person for whom it's happening, but the family members and the significant people um, in that person's life and their caregivers, um, that becomes important to really understand how that plays out in regular activities of daily living and not to become too hardwired, not to think, okay, well, on Monday, in that environment, it was all fine. Therefore, it's fine all the time. By the same token, because Monday there was a mishap, in this environment, you can't say it's going to be total mess everywhere. The trick becomes trying to figure out what environments are safe, what environments are problematic, and putting the safety nets in so that the person can have the most independence that's safe, while at the same time, everybody, the patient, the family members, the caregivers, understand the risks of other types of environments so that the safety nets can be put in. That's a very common 
uh, problem after stroke and any kind of brain injury. Um, sometimes it's a memory problem that really reflects the person's ability to pay attention. Sometimes uh, the problem has to do with understanding and learning information. The person's ability to learn and retain that information. And typically when we talk about memory, we're really talking about the retention issue. The person's ability to learn, retain, hold on to it. And not just hold on to it for five minutes, but hold on to it for some period of time. There are a variety of changes in mental status that can occur. We've talked a bit about the cognitive problems, the attention, concentration, memory, learning, visual, spatial, all of that. Uh, but if the uh, stroke is in an area that affects the person's uh, emotional system, you can see depression, you can see apathy, you can see irritability. Um, in very rare cases, you can see the opposite. You can see laughter and um, silliness. Um, those are more unusual kinds of uh, changes. Um, and there is a controversial literature about whether where the, the the stroke is impacts on whether you're at higher risk for depression. So for neurological reasons, for brain related reasons, you can see depression. But then the stroke is also happening in a human being. It's happening in a person with dreams, dreams and hopes and aspirations, uh, someone who was having a life before this happened. And th you're right, there's, there's a grief uh, period. There's a period of time when the person is trying to make sense of what's happened to them at a time when it's sometimes hard to think straight. And um, there can be grief and depression as a result of that. That's pretty normal, i.e. that can happen and it's typical and it's understandable. But then you can also see other types of changes that we might think of as depression that, are, uh, that go beyond what is normal grief. And um, these are disorders of mood, but it's important to realize that the grief and d disorders of mood are different. And it's important not to minimize how much of an impact this depression can have. And it is something worthy of treatment, not only because it affects quality of life and it affects the person's well-being, but also because it can affect health. Because depression, does, it affects our souls but it's not in our souls. It doesn't live in our souls. It lives in our body. It lives in our physiology. And it can impact our health in a way that's not good. It can um, increase the morbidity related to the stroke. That is, it can make the impairments appear more severe. It can reduce uh, our ability to recover. It can uh, make it more difficult to participate in rehabilitation. Um, and there is some newer evidence that it, that uh, the presence of depression makes it more likely that you might not survive a stroke. It not only affects your ability to engage in rehabilitation, but it may also affect, and it probably does, affect your ability to deal with the risk factors. Um, you know, if, if you're being asked to eat a certain way, well, you don't feel like eating, period. Um, or depression can affect you the other way. You want to eat a lot or you want to eat often. But it's, um, and I don't have a total explanation for this, but when we want to eat a lot, we tend not to want to eat carrots and salad um, and green beans. You know, we want to eat those things that are probably not the best for our heart and brain health, which are those things that are high in fat and high in uh, refined sugar all of those things that may not be the things that uh, would be advisable to have as the mainstay of your, of your intake. Um, it may also affect your alcohol intake, which is also not something that um, would be a good thing from the point of view of, of uh, depression if we're talking you know, excessive alcohol. We also know that um, alcohol beyond a certain point is a risk factor for stroke. So it's, and it's not a great thing from the point of view of brain recovery. So it, it compounds your ability to look after those healthy behaviors that are so important. Um, exercise, participation in exercise is another thing that can be complicated by depression because it affects your motivation. And initiation and motivation are big effects of being depressed. 
And so if you're not feeling like you really want to go down the street, let alone go and exercise, it becomes a problem. Um, now, you know, these are um, difficult issues anyway in a, in a stroke survivor. Um, and, and maybe we should talk a little bit about that as well. Um, because in a younger person who's had a heart attack, going to the gym is a very different prospect if you're 55 rather than if you're 75 or 80 going to the gym becomes a much more complicated thing plus the stroke itself affects those systems that are involved in exercise your motor system potentially and so it's a different thing if if you have problems in balance if you have problems in movement to then say okay now you have to exercise so it's very important and it can be done and it needs to be done but the way that it's going to be done is going to be different depending on your age and depending on what your impairments are. It's something that when you go back for stroke follow-up visits um, with you know your neurologist or who, whoever saw you in the hospital that that's something that will be monitored and so that your health care provider your physician will ask you those questions um, when you go to see your family physician that person will ask you those questions at the same time um, the family and the patient need that information to know that that's something that they need to be aware of and rather than trying to make the judgment, is this normal, is this something I need to get help with, I think the strategy of providing all that information back to your family doctor and talking with him or her and discussing it, because it's not a, something that can be decided um, based on one or two little bits of information. You have to look at the whole context. Because depression is not just depression. It's what is it associated with and what are the other symptoms that accompany it and has it, is it a, a situation of grief, is it a situation of uh, stroke related problems that look like depression but in fact are not um, or is it a disorder of mood that requires treatment and that can become, uh, that is a complicated question to ask. You don't want to decide ahead of time yourself that you're really depressed when in fact the problem is that your thyroid is out of sync. So I think the task for the patient is to be aware, for the family to be aware, to bring this information back to their family physician, to their neurologist, to their internist, whoever they're seeing, and then through that discussion it becomes apparent what the issues are and what needs to be done in terms of treatment. Coping to something that's made a major change in someone's life is a difficult thing. And just because we've had this life-altering event um, doesn't mean that we're going to cope the way we would think that we would cope. Um, and people, you know, people are who they are. And um, we come into these situations with all of our strengths and all of our vulnerabilities and all of our weaknesses. And so if we don't cope well with change before the stroke, we're not going to cope well with change during and after the stroke. And so it has to be seen in a context. I mean, we're used to thinking about it in terms of a medical context, a health context. But it's also a personal and psychological context. And it's um, our coping strategies and the way that we coped with things before become very relevant because the stroke is going to challenge us. It's going to challenge us personally if I've had the stroke, but it's going to also challenge the people around me and the people who care about me because they also have to deal with something that's uncontrollable and something that um, may not have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It may have a beginning and a middle and a middle and a middle and it goes on and in one split second life changes in a very dramatic way um, and that can be difficult because most of us unfortunately think of these kinds of illnesses as if they were acute changes and they're not. They're not abrupt changes that have a beginning, a middle, and an end. They're chronic situations. Now they change you know, the way that someone is and the way that someone's coping, both the patient and the family member, during the hyperacute phase when the person comes into hospital is going to be different than how they're coping six months down the road. So that it changes.
but it's still a, a, a chronic challenge that the person is going to have to figure out and problem solve. And how they cope and their patterns of coping are going to be really important. And we know that um, there are basic ways that people cope with these kinds of challenges. Some people become problem solvers. Some people avoid. Some people do things to numb their feelings. There are lots of different ways that people cope. And sometimes the way that people cope aren't complementary. So that if you have one partner who copes by problem solving and the other one that copes by avoidance, that's not going to work very well as a match. And so you end up seeing all sorts of problems that come from the coping because they're not compatible. Well, after a stroke, you have a period of increased likelihood of recovery. In other words, the first six months um, is the time that you're going to see the most dramatic recovery. And typically, you do see some recovery after the stroke. Um, and the rehabilitation strategies are there to help maximize that potential. Um, once you start to get to 6 to 12 months, it's still possible to see some further continued recovery. Um, after a year, um, you, usually people are at a stable place. Um, and how much recovery you're going to see is really dependent on individual by individual case. And your healthcare team, they're the best people to, to give you an idea of how much recovery you're going to see based on your condition, based on how vulnerable your brain was to begin with before you had the stroke, based on the stroke and where it was and the kinds of impairments and how big the stroke was, and based on the improvements that you've already made so that educated guesses can be made about what it's going to look like. But this isn't a perfect science. Sometimes, you know, people um, don't recover as well as we would have anticipated. Other times people recover better than we think. But then there are all sorts of other things we all need to be doing to maintain our health. And that's true whether we've had a stroke or not. And it's important to maintain all of those activities. So, you know, maintaining an engagement in life is something that's going to be good for all of us, regardless of whether we had a stroke or not. Um, maintaining um, good involvement in keeping those risk factors um, in, in pace, those things are going to be important. Um, but I think that it becomes really important not to focus everything on stroke and illness. We need to maintain some engagement in the positive parts of life. Um, and those things will maintain our resilience and make us less vulnerable to the negative things that can happen.